Let's pick up a particular threat in this context, which is malware on mobile devices. So this is something that has certainly evolved quite recently. So malware threat up to now, despite millions of mobile devices being in use, the malware threat has confined itself mostly to the PC environment. You know, there have been some reasons for this, so practical factors have held things back. So initially there were not really devices that had the capability to run a malware code. And then even when you had programmable devices carried around in people's pockets, there was a lack of a tangible population of users to actually infect because you had various different platforms in use, so there wasn't one to specifically go after. So from the malware writer's perspective, there was no real economic value to be going after these. There were, nonetheless, various proof of concepts. If you look along in the past, there were things like the Liberty Trojan, the Phage Virus, the Kabir Worm, affecting different generations of PDAs, this one particularly um, going on Bluetooth communications. So they got attention because they were quite, if you like, novel for having targeted mobile devices, but they didn't become widespread incidents that really people worried about too much. But over time, there has been a significant evolution. Um, so again, I won't read all of these out, but basically by around 2010, 2011, you've got the appearance of Android and significant malware, relatively speaking, starting to appear in that context. A few years ago, McAfee did a survey of about 2,000 users, asking them about their awareness and their experience of mobile device malware. And as you can see here, the vast majority, 86%, had no knowledge about malware on mobile devices. So if we're thinking phones, um, PDAs, tablets, as was, um, not many of them at that point. Um, okay, so the exposure and awareness were both far less than if you'd ask people about their experiences on the desktop environment. On the desktop, they would certainly all have been aware, or the vast majority would have been, and many more of them would have had personal experience. Here, only a couple of percent said they actually encountered it. Going back to our survey from Plymouth last year of our respondents, um, you can see quite dramatically malicious code is by far the least experienced um, by respondents of the categories that we said that, well, have you experienced this type of problem? or potential threat with your mobile device. So very few, and this is number rather than percentage, so only 11 respondents out of a couple of hundred or so had experienced malicious software on their device. Okay, now this is something from an article I wrote back in May of 2005, um, just, if you like, looking ahead. So the increasing incidence of malware on mobile devices is a significant cause for concern. The malware itself is becoming progressively more advanced, and the arrival of a viable and widespread population of potential targets is likely to result in it being a more frequent and troublesome issue. Okay, so there were already those early sort of phage, Kabir, and all the rest of it had, had appeared by this point, and it only seemed a matter of time before proper attention and circumstances to warrant proper attention would come to pass. Okay, what have been the driving factors? Well, the increased ownership of smartphones. We saw on the earlier slide a third of UK adults now have a smartphone, so that begins to become a fairly tangible population. Affordable mobile internet access, so people are getting the, the capability to be online and stay online with their mobile devices, so they are visible. And, of course, the storage of data, something worth getting from the mobile devices, some sort of valuable asset to attack, be it personal, be it corporate. Okay? We've established two different contexts for use, and the data in both cases is of interest to people. So this is now a tangible population of target devices with something worth having on them. Okay, so if we look at some, some statistics, and this is from data from Kaspersky Lab, um, different number of mobile malware families, 373 mobile malware modifications, over 20,000. Um, mobile malware up to May of this year, 3,500 new modifications. Key thing in terms of the growth of this is that in 2011, Kaspersky, just as one example of a, a, a vendor selling the protection, gathered as many samples of mobile malware that year as in the past six years combined. And the number of known samples from November of last year through to February of this year doubled. Okay, so significant growth of this particular category of problem. And in terms of the platform on which this growth is occurring, well, very demonstrably, it's on the Android platform because of the 
the marketplace, the Google Play environment in which the code can be put there with a very different mode of operation, model of operation, to, for example, Apple with iOS. So where Apple has the, the vetting, so to speak, the walled garden context, that's not the case for Android. And therefore, there is more potential for malware to slip through, and demonstrably, it's doing so. Okay, so relatively small bits on other platforms. Very small percentage there on iPhone. I met, as I mentioned earlier, this is down to jailbroken devices as a rule. So looking at the, the total known signatures up to April of this year, again, you can see significant growth in 2011 onwards. And in terms of mobile malware samples, a 600% increase in eight months. Okay, so in January 2011, there were just 20 unique samples. By April of this year, somewhere around um, 12 and a half to 13,000 different malware samples. So still dwarfed by the scale of the problem on the desktop environment, but something that you know, it's hard to ignore now as a mobile device user, particularly if you're using the Android platform. So what might it do, the different things that it might be trying to do? Unauthorized access to the device, revenue generation through things like SMS fraud, sending text premium numbers, collecting data um, from the device in terms of passwords and things of that nature, and um, download, providing tools to download and launch malicious code on the device, which again can do more insidious things when it's actually running on the platform. How might people encounter it? Well, downloading the code from the web, um, following links in a malicious SMS message, so it's one of the routes um, that's been more established, scanning QR codes if you're exploiting people in physical environments, so one of the risks with QR codes is you can't tell in some cases until you've scanned it where it's actually trying to lead you to, and it requires a conscious recognition on the part of the user that they, they need to make a value judgment on if they're being notified of it's going to take you here, whether that's a safe place to go. And, of course, code placed in the app stores themselves, particularly on the Android platform. So according to Sophos, from their threat report earlier this year, some, some examples. Um, so Google removed over 100 malicious apps from what was then the Android market back in 2011. December of last year, criminals... Um, published apps that claim to offer copies of games such as Angry Birds and Need for Speed. They were removed fairly quickly when it became apparent that it was malware code, but nonetheless, they were downloaded around 10,000 times before that happened. So there is a potential to reach uh, a vulnerable audience. And I say, with people being less aware of the potential threats in this context, they are less likely to be running antivirus, anti-malware type controls on the mobile device. Um, another example from back in the summer, six men arrested um, for creating a, an Android a bit of malware that claimed to be a porn video viewer. So basically they set up a site, put some video content on there, made an app available for people to download, and when run, it was basically demanding money rather than playing the video. About 10,000 people again downloaded it. Only 211 victims made the payment, but still a you know, not inconsiderable amount of money. Was, was garnered from that particular scam. So it doesn't require too many people to, do, to fall for it before, you know, from the, the perspective of those creating the malware, it actually generates some revenue. Okay, more things from the, the article I wrote back in 2005. In the mobile domain, we're confronted with an even greater population of users, all of whom have been using their devices without any prior cause for concern will face a comparably greater challenge in educating users and ensuring appropriate protection unless safeguards become standard provision for the new devices. Okay, so in some contexts, uh, so the, the, the distinction between the iOS and Android platforms is significant here. In some contexts, it's you know, not that they're having to run a particular technology on iOS, it's that the, the, the whole model of it is basically creating a scenario where malware has less opportunity to take hold as opposed to Android, which is heralded as being more open, and you know, it is, but there isn't a standard provision of antivirus protection on the devices that are being sold. So it's, in a sense, recreating the problems that we've seen for years in the PC context, where it comes down to a decision needing to be made by the individual user as to whether to protect themselves or not. And so, we, as a user community in general, seem to learn little from the past. So... As individuals, 
people become vulnerable in each new context as it appears. So we saw it with malware sort of on um, desktop devices going from email to instant messaging to other contexts and each time the population needs to be re-educated that oh there's a threat there, there's a threat there rather than having that more general awareness. And here, okay, mobile devices being easily and quickly adopted but without that recognition that actually the threat exists there just as it has on the devices you've readily protected on the desktop. Okay, so some related evidence there. I won't read through all of that, but a couple of surveys from 2011. Okay, the sort of advice I gave, again, in a fairly dated um, book now, um, written all the way back in, what was it, 2009 or something, when the mobile malware threat was still more of a concept than a proven fact. Um, so it's rare, but not non-existent at that time. So... Caution is warranted, AV protection is likely to be increasingly necessary. Yes, it is now. Exercise caution um, with what you're doing. Attackers will capitalise on the fact that you expect less of the mobile device as being a source of threats, and that is being proven now. And the attacks will change and increase over time, and that's certainly been proven as well. So much of the what to do about it advice is not new stuff. You need to understand the risks of the platform that you're using, so that for organisations means make users aware. Um, be aware of the routes by which you as an individual can encounter malware, use the protection, and consider wider safeguards, such as backup, such as access control, to ensure that your device is protected and safeguarded as best you can. For organisations, there ought to be a policy. Ensure that there's awareness raising and that users know what their responsibilities are. Consider whether you could utilise mobile device management so you've got a level of control over the devices if you believe them to be compromised. Um, and incorporate scanning of mobile devices at least into your AV provision. So making sure they're scanned as well as the other devices you're looking at. 